Hey, everybody. Welcome to the CCW Safe podcast. My name is Rob. Hi, I'm your host here at CCW Safe base in Oklahoma City. Uh, today, we are absolutely honored to have Ed Monk, our guest for the day. I'm not going to go deep dive into his background. I'm going to let him do that a little bit. But Ed is uh, Lieutenant Colonel from the Army and uh, currently teaches civilians and law enforcement some uh, shooting stuff and has done an incredible uh, gathering of information reference active shooters that I am still going through. Um, Ed, glad to have you, buddy. Thank you. Thanks for having me on your show. Yeah, you bet. Um, give us a little bit of your background real quick. Tell us where you grew up. Tell us about your ed education. And and then I'd kind of like to go how you went with the uh, the uh, active killer stuff about, about how you went from military to education and, and that kind of thing. Sure. Well, I grew up here in a small city in Arkansas where I am now back living and have been for like the last 12 years. I joined the military immediately after leaving high school. Uh, did 24 years active duty in the Army. The last 20 of that as a armor officer. So I was in units, commanding units with tanks and cavalry. And then immediately upon leaving the Army, uh, I started teaching high school and I taught high school for four years. And, and that's really what got me into the active shooter thing. And I also got into defensive shooting and I also got into law enforcement uh, and then moved back here. Uh, after I retired out of the military, I lived in Louisville, Kentucky for three years before moving back here. But the main thing that got me into this active shooter thing, it was strictly personal reasons, yep. was when I left the military and I started teaching high school. And let me say that I taught in one of the top high schools in the state uh, that I was in. Very good high school, very good uh, leaders, faculty, and very good parents and very good students. But I was a 42-year-old retired colonel, but I was a snot-nosed, brand-new rookie teacher. So as the new kid on the block, you keep your mouth shut and you do what you're told. And what I and other new teachers were told uh, there in the summer of 2007 at that school was if we had an active shooter in the school, our job as the authority figure, uh, the teacher, the adult in the room, was to gather all my kids in the corner of the room, pack them in the blind corner, the corner that could not be seen from the door, and just hold them there. And we would just hold them there and see who showed up first, the, the shooter to kill them or the cops. And that just absolutely made no sense to me. One that we would just sit there and wait on him to come in the room. But the other one was uh, that we, we would do the thing that made the shooter's job the absolute easiest we could do, which is all bunch up in a real tight group. But Again, I'm the brand new teacher, and plus, sometimes you think things sound wrong, that the plans are bad, the decisions are bad, but later you discover you did not understand all the parameters and all the information. So I initially kept my mouth shut, and so I started looking into this, because these are people with master's degrees and PhDs. Uh, so I started looking into the active shooter to figure out there's got to be something I don't understand if packing everybody in the corner of the room is the best thing to do, but it turns out that is not the best thing to do. That is the absolute worst thing to do. And yet still today, I don't know what the percentage is, but it's a large portion of American schools. That is still the plan. And can you imagine if the school's plan for fire, if a fire actually did break out in the school was just to keep the kids in the classroom and just see who showed up first. If the fire got to your kids first or the firemen got to the kids first, mm -hmm. hopefully we would, you know, rush uh, school board meetings and get that stopped because that's putting our kids at risk. But yet for over 40 years, we've been having the same plan at schools across the country that put our kids at high risk and almost, almost guarantee a high victim count. So that's how I got into this and just keep studying. And the initial goal was for me to understand it. And then when I thought I understood it, I was like, well, I'll just start showing this to the schools. And surely when they see this, they'll change their mind. Um, but they didn't uh, for a whole list of reasons. Yes. They just keep, keep a plan that has proven to be a failure in the past and they just refuse to change it. Well, it's the perfect setup for your shooter. I mean, it, it is literally fish in a barrel. I mean, you're, you're walking up and everybody's right there. And all I do is just keep, keep my, my fire focused on that, on that corner and, and reload when necessary. 
Yeah, and imagine if you could get all the fish in the barrel to bunch up in one small port, part of that yeah. barrel. That would be even better. What I tell schools is other than pulling out my own gun and shooting my own kids as the teacher, I cannot make his job any easier than to pack him in the corner and wait for him to come on and, and kill her. He doesn't have to aim, and he's probably going to get multiple people with each shot because they're one right behind the other. Well, and you know, one of the other things, if, if you just let kids' natural instinct take over, if they just scatter and try as hard as they can to get away from it, they're safer than what we've done to them. Yeah, a baby rabbit knows to run away from something, somebody shooting at it. I've shot at animals before, and they run away. That's what they're wired to do, and that's what we're wired to do, uh, not to sit there and just wait on the person to get closer and eventually shoot us. But we're making artificial rules for the sake of order. That we can't let the kids run because it would take hours to get accountability of them. So let's let's all have them stay in the room, and that'll make our job of accounting for them easier. And I would say, yeah, if they're all dead on the floor of my classroom, it's very easy to account for them. But is accountability of them the most important thing? But yeah, uh, kids ran out of classroom ten when uh, the shooter's gun went empty, and he went to do a reload. They the eleven that left all lived. If you've seen the video of Yavaldi, there's a little elementary kid in the hallway that sees the guy come in, and when he starts shooting, the kid makes a decision to run in the opposite direction. And that's absolutely the right decision. But for some reason, for order and discipline, and I think a pro one of the many problems is leaders, especially in our schools, we want to make plans for all the days the shooter doesn't show up. So staying in the room, accounting for everybody, uh, is is a great plan for the day the shooter doesn't show up. And that's that's 99.999% of days. So let's make the plans that are easy to type and easy to drill, not the plans that'll save our kid's life if he comes here. Yeah, absolutely. Now, does is has Arkansas taken a step to allow teachers to be armed? Do you know Arkans that? Arkansas has always, uh, well, at least since, since I've been back here, and I know one of the schools I uh, train, they've, They've had armed school staff for over 20, 25, 30 years. So I don't know how far it goes back. But basically, yeah, Arkansas, it's called the uh, Commission School Security Officer. Basically, they took the what the program the state police runs for armed guards to, to train them, to certify them, and they just repackaged it under a new name. But it's pretty much the same thing. It's it's cumbersome. It's bureaucratic. Uh, and not, not a lot of schools do it, but... Uh, I lost count and they're, they're not really publicizing the number, but it's over 30 schools and we train a couple of them every year. But the problem is just like having a cop with a gun somewhere on the school property yes. is not the mathematical solution to this. Having four or five armed staff members up in the administration building is not the, the mathematical solution to this. Having armed staff is not the sole fix for this. If you don't have enough of them and they're not spread out, intelligently and geographically so that at least one of them is very likely to hear or see the first shot. Yeah, absolutely. And another part of that, that lesson that I, that I picked up from you down, you know, Ed, I was fortunate enough to sit through a couple of his presentations this year at the uh, range master attack con conference, um, got into the, the time factor and, you know, even in, even in uh, Nashville, which was crazy because I don't remember if it was a Monday or Tuesday, but I had just sat through your course and we, by the time everybody shakes out and gets home, we had the, the shooter at the, the Christian school in, in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, I yeah. felt I felt like their law enforcement response was probably as good as you could ever hope for. Those guys oh. arrived quickly. They, they deployed quickly. Um, now, and you also know this, not everybody wearing a badge and a gun is, is going to be that point guy. I mean, you, it takes a special person to actually go charging at, at the sound of gunfire. Yeah, I, I'm not sure how quick they got there. Once they got in the building, everything I've seen from the dash from the body cams, once they got in the building, they were, I thought, did very well. They had about a medium search, medium speed search, 
yeah. uh, when they got in because they couldn't hear the shooting. And then the shooting started up again. They transitioned to a fast search. And I loved it. They bypassed victims instead of stopping to treat them. They didn't or, give verbal warnings. Didn't give verbal warnings once they saw the active shooter actively shooting. What I don't know yet, and I've just been just yesterday been given contact information for one of the officers there. So I hope to learn more is um, why did it take them so long to get in the building? I mean, they didn't enter the building for well over 10 minutes after the first shot was fired. Uh, so that's that's an unknown to me now. I didn't I didn't realize that. Yeah, they didn't get in the building till 11, 12 minutes, maybe 13. I don't know the exact, but it's, I know it's more than 10 minutes after the first shot was fired is when the first cop got in the building. I don't know when they arrived on scene. Uh, and I'm scared that we're going to learn the wrong lesson uh, with the Nashville shooting. Uh, because I think the lesson will be, hey, if you have aggressive police response, once they get in the building, you have a low victim count. And I, I, my gut here, again, I don't have any good data yet, but my gut is we just had a shooter that was not very aggressive. Yeah. The, sh the shoot rate here was slower than one person shot every two and a half minutes. Um, shot roughly, what I can count, was in there able to shoot for 16 minutes. You know, the Pulse nightclub shooter shot 17 minutes and got 102. Uh, so this person... The, the Indiana mall shooter only shot for 15 seconds and got five, almost the same amount that this shooter got in 16, 15 minutes of shooting. So I think we just had a shooter that wanted to do a public shooting, wanted to have suicide by cop, but wasn't really interested in getting a high body count, which most of them are. And unfortunately I've worked with a lot of schools since Uvalde and the private schools to me are more serious about this than the public schools. And I, every private school I, I did up to that point, I would say, well, I can only show you data from public schools because there has not yet been a private school attack. And well, now I can't say that anymore. Yeah. Um, one of the other interesting things, and, and I think, I think the stuff that you presented to us down in Texas started back in 89 up to present is that is that right as far as active shooters and mean, maybe just school shooters yeah i think the first school shooting that i was the stockton which was 89 they go back further than that but that's probably i i used to show earlier ones and i change them up every time but yeah stockton was the first one i showed in 89 all the way up to uvalde well and for our listeners um there, there's kind of a a uh, there's there's a uh, equation for body count for time over in the big picture of of studying all these things. Uh, can you speak on that just a little bit? Well, sure. I mean, it's just common sense. If if you if you start a building on fire, the longer you let that fire burn, the more of that building is going to be consumed. And same way with once he starts shooting, the longer you let him shoot, the more victims you're going to have. Or if you want to take a more positive approach, the quicker you stop him, the fewer victims you'll have. So what I show the chart for organizational leaders, it looks to me like for average shooters, there are, it's going to be worse if they're really fast. It's going to not be as bad if they're slow, but for your average shootings, if we let him shoot for one minute before we stop him, you can probably plan on having eight to 14 people shot at the end of that first minute when you stop him. Parkland shot right at the average, but he shot 14 in his first minute. If you let him shoot for two minutes before you stop him, then you're look, you can probably expect 16 to 22 victims to be shot at the end of that attack. If you let him shoot for three minutes, 22 to 26 seems to be what you can expect. And then he'll, his shoot rate will, will slow down after that, but he will continue to keep shooting people. So it's, so what I say is there's almost always one shooter, but even if there is only one shooter, there's two enemies we have to fight. One is the shooter. The other is the clock that starts ticking as soon as he shoots. And our response plan has to go beyond just stopping the active shooter. We have to have a plan that stops him quickly. Just like we don't want the fire department to tell us, just let your house keep burning. It'll eventually burn out. The goal is not to let the house burn to the ground and then stop. The goal is to put, put the fire out quickly. And that's what almost no organization is factoring into their plan. If you ask most school superintendents, if a shooting starts at one of your schools, how long will you allow it to last? How long will you allow a shooter to shoot at your school? Which, most of them will look, look at you with a funny look because they're like, why are you asking me? That's that's not my problem, but yes, it is. Yeah, you have a say. Uh, 
Or they'll say, well, I hope not long. Well, hope, we got to get beyond hope and we have to start planning. It's If you ask a superintendent, uh, you have a chemistry lab in your high school. It's got Bunsen burners and dangerous chemicals. Who's responsible for the safety of the students in that chemistry lab? And he'd say, well, the chemistry teacher, the principal, and ultimately me. Mm -hmm. Same thing with shop class with saws and tools that can hurt you. Well, who's responsible for the safety there? Well, it's the shop teacher, the principal, and ultimately me. You're, you got a football team. You, you require your kids to slam into each other at a high rate of speed. Who's responsible for the safety of that? Well, it's the coach the principal and ultimately me. And if you say who's responsible for the safety of your kids, if an active shooter comes in your school, they'll point you down the road to the police department or the sheriff's office. And it's like, that's, that's why we continually get high twenties, thirties, and forties for victim counts because they're, they're forfeiting, uh, they're, they're part of this and their leadership of this. There's no mathematical way you can call somebody who is not there when the attack starts and bring them there in time to keep a low victim count. It's just a losing mathematical problem. The, so the only, the only solution, if you want a low victim count or a chance on affecting a low victim count, is the intended victims have to be the one to stop it. The people there that he intends to shoot have to stop this. That is the only solution mathematically to have a good chance, still not a guarantee, a good chance of keeping this at, at single digit victims. And I haven't met anybody else who seriously says, no, they, they would prefer to keep having victim counts in the twenties, thirties, and forties. Everybody says they want fewer victims, but almost no one is making any changes that makes it likely that they will have single digit victims. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I recently had to, had to respond to one of our members that was involved in a self-defense incident um and and very clearly it's a it's a really easy case as far as the law enforcement end of it um it's very clear cut it was a home invasion um the the intruder was threatening verbally and and physically demonstrating that that uh he intended harm to to the member um there was actually a doorway available that he didn't have to go anywhere near the member, but he chose to advance and he wound up shooting and expiring for his evil intentions. Um, and it was forever before law enforcement got there. And yep. anybody that's ever been involved in things like that knows that it feels like it took forever but usually it's it's much much faster than what you think you know in the city where i worked if you didn't have an officer coming through your doorway in 90 seconds or two minutes that was an exorbitant amount of time um, we had a really rapid response to priority one calls and and but by that same token i can also sit here and tell you that I've flown down the road trying to get to a, a hot call and pass guys that are sitting on the side just typing away on their computer. You know, when when lives were in danger to me, everything else was secondary. That you shove everything else to the side and go go try and put that fire out as fast as you can, kind of thing. Uh yeah, but it, law law enforcement, unfortunately, almost always is limited to how quickly they get the call. Yes. So there's almost always 10 or more victims that have already been shot by the time the first 911 call is made. And there is usually 20 or more victims shot by the time the first cop, well, any cop gets a radio call dispatched. So it doesn't matter how fast they drive, how aggressive the cops are once they get there. Yes. Generally, a good, aggressive, trained cop is only going to keep it at 30 and, and not let it get to 40 or 50. And that we want them to do that if they get there and it's still going on. But I think our goal ought to shift from keeping it in the 30s or the 20s or 30s. Our goal ought to shift to single digits. I was just up in Michigan and there were cops and EMTs in several of my classes. And one of the EMTs says, Oh, every year we do a big active shooter exercise where the cops, the fire, the EMT, and we, we include a mass casualty exercise. Sure. And I, and I thought to myself, that's, we, we see that's, I think that's an example that we've just accepted that if they have one, it's going to be a mass casualty. Why don't we not accept that and change our plans 
so that it's a low victim and it's not a mass casualty. And, and that is, it's doable. It, uh, history shows us that there is a plan that gives us an extremely high chance of a low victim count if we'll just go there. But we seem for some reason to be just fine hoping it doesn't happen here. And if it does, well, it's going to be a mass casualty exercise. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, Jack know. Wilson said uh, the first cop entered his church over four minutes after the 911 call. And I, I don't know how long after he shot the guy that the 911 call was made. Yeah. Uh, the Greenville, uh, Greenwood Mall in Indiana here just last July, uh, Eli, Eli Dickin mm -hmm. shot that guy, then went and found an unarmed mall cop and explained what happened to him. And then that mall cop went outside and waited on the first police car to arrive. So it's not the cop's fault. It's the fault of the system that brings the cop to the location. Absolutely. Yeah. It, anytime we start making it, it, and it just makes my skin crawl to, to see these things that are designated gun safe zones. And what, what you've told me is you've made a, a safe zone for a shooter. You, you've made a yeah. safe zone for the attacker. That's just going to be that simple. In order to get the body count that most of them want, they have to start in a place where no one can shoot back. You can't you can't go into a police station and start shooting and expect to get 30 bodies before you're shot. So they generally don't go in there. Or gun shows or NRA conventions, they generally don't go there to start their active shooter. They go to a place generally, they plan to go to a place where they don't expect to get shot back. Je Shortly before the shooter went into the Greenwood Mall in Indiana, uh, he posted about uh, gun-free zones. And the although Indiana is a, a concealed carry and I think a constitutional carry state now, the mall had a policy yes. that you couldn't carry there. Not It was not a criminal act, as I understand it, to violate that mall's policy. But the mall tried to make it a gun-free zone. Of course, it's not going to be gun-free because the criminals will bring theirs. Yes, um, and, and to their credit, you know, they, they kind of uh, wrote up a, a thing in support of Mr. Dickens, you know, thankfully they didn't go just completely haywire about who was violating their, their terms on their property kind of thing. Um, yeah. similarly, a psychiatrist in Pennsylvania, again, Pennsylvania is a concealed carry state, but the hospital. The hospital's policy was only on-duty law enforcement could carry on the property, but the doctor violated policy and had one in his office when a psych patient started shooting, and he pulled his gun that he wasn't supposed to have out and shot the psych patient and stopped it. And even the extremely anti-gun district attorney there said he, he, he obviously saved a number of lives. They don't know how many, but him, him reacting with a gun obviously saved a lot of lives. Yeah, and yeah, we don't know how many, but we also kind of have a, an educated guess on on what it could have been. Yeah, uh, well, Eli Dickin in the mall in Greenwood, he shot five people in fifteen seconds. So he, his shoot weight rate early on, when in a crowded place, which is typical, one every three seconds. So, I most of the time, if I cover that, I'll I'll show the police chief's uh, comments at a press conference. And the police chief says, all, all we can hope for is an Eli Dickin to be in the right place at the right time. Yes. And I would suggest why don't, if I, if for leaders of schools, businesses, and churches, why don't we go beyond hope? Instead of hoping we have an Eli Dickin, why don't we plan to have somebody there that, like Eli Dickin, can stop it in the first 15 seconds and keep the victim count in the single digits? I mean, we have clear examples of what works and what keeps the victim count low. So we just refuse. Unfortunately, a lot of leaders refuse to go there. Well, I, I've I've seen enough of what the world has to offer that you just I, I don't I don't move around the, the world without a firearm. <laughs> I just do. Um, I'll apologize and I'll leave your your premises if you ask me to leave because I'm breaking your rules. But uh, I'm I'm not going to sit there and and be unarmed and unprepared. Um, the that, others... would, that would be like driving without your seatbelt. Why would you take that risk? Yes. Now the risk the risk the odds are very very small on any given day. Yes. But if the dice rolls against you and they're they're very small on any given day, but over a lifetime it's significant that you'll get into a car collision. And so yeah. why take the risk? 
Yeah. The, the rhythm, seat belt rhythm, is an yeah. seat belt's rhythm, an uncomfortable. Rhythm, yeah, the seat belt's an uncomfortable, inconvenient thing. I hate it. I absolutely hate it. But I I, I hate going through my own windshield even more. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And you know, there's plenty of really good guys out there. You and your brother are, are running your stuff out, out in Arkansas. I mean, I'm talking about all over the country now. Um, that are, you know, you'll you'll see things at, kind of attributed to their to their training stuff. That you know, you are your first res- your own first responder, or be your own cavalry, or but that that's something that is, I still believe as free Americans is, is really incumbent on us to, to step out and, and kind of take the lead on that. We should, we should all take part in, in making this a safer place. <clears throat> yeah. So somebody has to fight the, the only, the only way mathematically to have an expectation of a low victim count and active shooter attack is somebody has to fight. Not everybody. Uh, but I always fight is the first consideration because the sooner somebody fights, the lower the victim count will be. And I, yes. I had a guy, and he said, I have a five-year-old in pre-K. You tell me I have to tell my daughter to fight. No, everybody doesn't have to fight. Correct. But they're going to start in a crowded place. That's what they do. So it only takes one or two. All it takes is one or two, Eli Dickens, Vic Stacy, Jack Wilson, David George, John Hurley. It just takes one or two yes. people who are armed, present, and willing. And I know, uh, just like we should accept the world is not as it ought to be, to use Dr. April's slogan, and prepare for these horrible active shooters, I accept that as of now, although I, I disagree with it, most schools and other places are not going to have armed staff. Yeah. So when I talk to them, I go heavy with showing them examples of where you can fight and stop these active shooters without a gun. Yeah. You can confront them and fight them unarmed. It's not my preferred method. It doesn't have as good of a track record. But if you don't have a gun, then your only options are to fight unarmed or watch a whole bunch of people get shot. So you got to fight unarmed. So I show them successes where that has taken place and talk to them about doing training and prepositioning weapons so that that is what they plan to do, not just turn the lights out, lock the door, get in the corner, and hope he goes to another uh, another classroom, not theirs. Correct. Yeah, it, it's crazy. Um, what What kind of things are you guys offering as far as training on your site? Well, I do presentations and I've been traveling a lot with that. I can do just a broad, which is what I did at TACCON, really a broad study of the active shooters. So we look at attacks at schools, churches, businesses, government offices, outdoor locations. And then really what I did at TACCON, I did a three hour broad study and then I tacked on an, an hour of, okay, for those of us who go armed, Yes. Cop, cop or not cop. For those of us who go armed and we we think we will fight this threat if it pops up, what are some considerations for training, gear, mindset, tactics, et cetera? And then I can do a school focused where I only talk about school attacks, but then I go much heavier into planning policies, training for staff, building alterations and stuff specifically for schools. I can do uh, specifically for churches or specifically for businesses. And I can do a full consultancy with them where I will stay and go through the stuff that I recommend they do with them. Um, as far as gun classes, we do an active shooter response class, which includes a live fire. And, and it's specifically tailored for the active shooter. So the drills are meant to build up skills towards, and then eventually going into live fire individual scenarios. And we use three-dimensional mannequin dummies uh, and photographic targets to do that we've done one two and three day um, right now we're so busy we don't really schedule those but we'll do them like we're doing a school if a school or a group of sros or a church security team calls us and says we would like one or two or three days and then since uh i don't know 19 or so i've been doing an active shooter instructor class where it's a, the same structured class but it's focused on the instructor so we don't only do it but we go through why we do it how we set it up lessons that I've learned, things that I've tried and failed, not only how to do the classroom portion, but how we set up and do the range training and the methodology behind it. And I used to just do, when I started, two a year, one in April and one in October. But since Yavaldi, everything's gone so crazy. I think I did seven in 2022, and I'm probably going to do six or seven in uh, 2023. And I've already got some scheduled in 2024. And, uh, of course, we do the regular stuff. We do handgun fighting classes. We do 
class to get your concealed carry and your enhanced license that we now have in Arkansas. And then my brother does precision rifle, which I'm no part of that, but he does precision rifle because we have a rifle range here that goes out to 480 yards. Very nice. Um, what, uh, what kind of places do you look at when you are seeking information for you, when you're, when you're doing expanding kind of kind of your skill set um you know it's one of the things we i always i always like to tell people that you know yeah i hear a lot about this guy who does he train with who does he train under where where does this guy reach out even if it's just going to peer review a course but there's so many ways for us as instructors also to plug in and aside from our own personal studies um who are, who are some of the guys that you think out there that you go, man, that guy's, that guy's on point. <clears throat> well, I've done a lot of training with Tom Givens through range master. Yeah. And uh, I'm lucky that I've got my own facility so I can host these people Absolutely. and bring them into my facility. And I've hosted, uh, I've gone through his instructor development, shotgun instructor development. Uh, and he kind of gave me a start in TACCON doing my active shooter stuff, but I've done, trained a lot with Tom. And then Greg Elifritz, we met when we were both instructors at Tactical Defense Institute many years ago, and we met way back then. But I've hosted Greg a couple of times and hope to do in the future. He's always uh, appreciate guys who are not only talkers but thinkers, and Greg's a thinker and a researcher, uh, and I, I like that. And we'll, we'll sit and have discussions about what have you heard, what do you think, what's your gut on this. Yes. Uh, 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 we've had uh, Mike Seeklander here. Uh, we've had John Hearn here and hope to have him again. Of course, John helps out with some of Tom's classes and just by going to TACCON, you know, you can, it's like a buffet. You can sample so many different instructors and I've trained there with Gabe White. Uh, and I'm probably going to forget some people that I've trained with while I'm there. Uh, but that's a good way to do it. I, I just finished going to my third Alita conference. Uh, in St. Louis and I speak there, but then if I'm, if I'm there the whole week, there's just an unbelievable amount of law enforcement instructors there that you can sample from. Tell, tell our viewers what, what that is. It's uh, Alita is an organization called the International Law Enforcement Educator and Trainers Association. And if you join that, you have to get sponsored in, but if you join that, then you can then attend the conference. And it's just a week long. It's like TACCOM, but it's, it's for law enforcement trainers. Right. So you, you go there and, you know, everything from hands-on batons, uh, spike strips, training gear, and there's live fire classes as well as uh, classroom classes. So it's kind of like TACCON for fire, firearms trainers, or I'm sorry, law enforcement trainers only. You yeah. get, a, you get five days of all day long. You can pick, uh, and you, I think everything's repeated a second time. So uh, you got a better chance of getting the classes you want to get. And, and I've gone to alert as well, but that's, that's more focused on this active shooter thing and the national school safety conference. And this year for the first time, I'll go to the NASRO national association of school resource officer. And I'll be speaking there, uh, in, uh, July 2nd, I think I've Good. gone to several state SRO school safety conferences, but this will be my first national. one. Very good. I wasn't, I wasn't aware that, that Arkansas had had at least the the opportunity and ability to to have armed teachers for that long um i know of course when you and i grew up you you'd have a coach grab you and and say hey what that new shotgun i saw in the back window of your truck because <laughs> everybody i ran with had a had a shotgun in the back window on a rack and a pistol under the seat yeah i i bird hunted with my ninth grade science teacher my 10th grade biology teacher reloaded uh, 38 handgun ammunition for me. And if you look in my yearbook of my high school, as I, I guess mo a lot of high schools do, the week of homecoming, they have dress up days. Every day is a different dress up day. And this picture was taken on Western Day, and I've got my dad's Western uh, gun belt on with a fairly realistic looking plastic Western pistol. And I'm holding it to the head of my best friend who's acting like he's scared. And that's that picture's in our yearbook. That, that would get a kid suspended pending his expulsion hearing today for having a plastic pistol and playing like that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We, we, we overreact on the stuff that doesn't matter. Yeah. It means, nothing. and then we don't react correctly to what actually does matter. And I, 
uh, we had a, the school district up in Michigan where I, the police department uh, hosted me, the, the superintendent, several members of the school board, all the principals, they came in. And you could see them struggling. Now, the fact that they came there, they care, they want to do something. But you could see them struggling with, this is not what we signed up for. We, you know, we would have went in the army. We would have joined the police department if we wanted to fight people. We don't want to fight people. This is not what we signed up for. But if we don't do it and wait on the people that have signed up to fight people to get here, we're not going to like the numbers. So you could see them struggling with, we don't want to do this, but we see the problem if we don't. Well, and in, in speaking with them, superintendents or, or, or admin staff, things like that, um, it, it's amazing, not the verbal response you get, but the physical response you get when you pose the question to them, what is the acceptable number for you? Oh, yeah, they won't talk about that. That's why... I think when I suggest to them single digits, because they don't no superintendent wants to be on record as saying, I will accept nine of my kids getting shot or seven of my kids getting shot. Yeah. Politically, they couldn't survive that. But single digits includes nine and seven and four, and it also includes zero. And zero, yeah. And it's attainable. It is attainable. Uh, if we can stop him in the first 30 seconds, we've got about a 90 plus percent chance. So yeah, they don't want to talk about that at the that one of the national school safety conferences I was at, I, one of the things I attended was a panel of superintendents from across the country. There's about 15 of them up there on stage. And I specifically remember one, the panel wasn't all on active shooter, but it was school safety, but they got to discussing the active shooter. And at one point, one of the superintendents on the panel said, listen, listen, it's not our job to stop him. And he pointed to a cop in the audience. He says, that's why we have law enforcement. It's not our job to stop him. And I thought, and that's why. We routinely get high twenties, thirties, and forties because if we wait on the cop, that's what we—that's our country's default system—is to call nine one one and wait on somebody to stop it, and and let until we change that default system, we we can fully expect to get those high numbers. Well, even even the progression in in response for law enforcement just through the the time that I was active, you know, that we really didn't have anything really in place if, if something like that happened you call the tag team and then oh my god yeah we all of a sudden we see columbine and it's like you can't wait that long so let's now we're going to wait until we get three guys together and we'll we'll put in a, a you know a small diamond and, and go in and start hunting down the threat and then all of a sudden it's like that's too long you can't yep. wait because because seconds are lives um, I was so thankful. I've, I've always been so impressed with, you know, they were friends of mine before they were my employers. Um, but the ownership group of, of this company, um, not only were they really good cops, but they really think about the services that we offer. And, um, you know, we don't cover on-duty law enforcement stuff. We don't cover on-duty security guard stuff. But they've taken the step that uh, after Uvalde, that we have a package for teachers now that, that, that gives them the same coverage that all our other members get. Now they have to do whatever state requirements they have that are in place. And, and obviously not all states have that, um, but Texas and Florida do. And, and I, like I said, I didn't realize that Arkansas did as well. Um, yeah, in Arkansas, and I'm told this by a superintendent that I trust. I, I haven't researched it, but the, there's something in the Arkansas law he has told me that that gives them some kind of immunity. But that's one of the weapons that's being used in other states as they pass laws that allow the basically the superintendent to do whatever he or she wants in their school district. Insurance companies are saying, if you go armed, if you make that decision, even though it's it's now legal to do so, we will not insure you anymore. So that's one of the weapons uh, that's being used is the insurance companies. That is so crazy. Yeah. And just, just crazy. What, what is their acceptable number? <laughs> well, they'll get, uh, they, they will write big checks if he shows up there, you know, the lawsuits against Parkland and we're going to see the same thing against Uvalde. Absolutely. And, it, and well, I, you know, we talked about the Alita conference and I was there and of course I covered Uvalde and it's a room full of, of cop instructors. 
And I was like, why did we have 20 or more victims at Uvalde? And they all raised their hand and it's all cop related. Well, no unity of command, no, no, uh, aggressive, no. And it was all cop related. And I said, well, no guys, the reason we had over 20 is because of the school's plan. The school's plan was if someone came in there, they could just shoot for several minutes until the cops showed up. Yes. The cops could have kept it to 30 instead of 38. Uh, but he shot the vast majority of his rounds before the cops ever got in the building. He shot less than 30 after the cops got in the building. And some of those shots were at the cops. So, yes. The, is the, but everybody is blaming the cops for why of the big number. Same in Parkland. And he, and by the way, uh, May 31st, I think I just read the uh, the jury selection starts in the criminal trial for the SRO at Parkland. Um, but he could not have stopped. Even had he rushed in the SRO at Parkland, he couldn't have saved the people shot on the first floor because he got there too late. Yeah, He could have helped the people on the 10th floor, and that's why he's only getting charged with 10 counts of the crimes because it's the 10 people that got shot there. So it's it's all about time and math. It's not what the police do five minutes after the first shot it's not what how what kind of locks do you have on your doors it the, it's time and math it's how long are you leader of your church your school your business how long are you going to let him shoot and if you let him shoot until the cops show up and stop him you're not going to like the number i promise you you're not going to like the number. well and you know you were you were talking about um uh, you know if, if i'm the responding guy I'm, I'm not addressing victims, you know, you're, you're, and that, that is so hard for people to stomach, but yes. the threat is still that way. I have to, I'm sorry, we're going to come back. We're going to, we're going to get, we're going to get EMTs in here. We're going to get you taken care of, but that's not my mission. My mission is to stop this threat as fast as I can. And yeah. Uh, and Everybody logically will admit that. But what I tell them is what, what responding officers are going to have to do is override their emotional pull Absolutely. once they start seeing victims. And I show them examples of where Parkland, two of the five-man team, pulled off to evacuate a guy out. Uh, the, the two SROs at Santa Fe, when the lead one got shot, the second one broke contact with the shooter to pull that first cop away. Yes. And I play a video of one of the two first cops in the basement at AME Church in Charleston. And he bypassed a guy that had been shot that was holding out his hands, begging for help. Yes. And he talks about how tough that is to live with, but he knew that was the right thing to do. And then luckily what we saw in part uh, in the covenant school in Nashville is, and I played the video, they're going up the stairs and they say, we got one down, keep pushing. Because yes. our job is to prevent future victims, not to treat past victims. Yeah. Um, you can't patch holes faster than he can make new holes. Correct. You know, we're, we're talking about that response and how, how quickly do they get there and what about this and what about that? And, and well, why don't you just send in, you know, your your EMTs at the same time you send in your cops in? Well, because now I'm placing them in jeopardy. And and most people don't know that that call to 911 comes in. So they're they're getting everything they can right up front. You know, it's this location. This is what we have. We we don't know how many shooters we have or we do know how many shooters we have or, or think we do and you're pushing all the the uh, law enforcement response that you can at one time and no we're not waiting for the tac team you're you're gonna go address your threat um but they're also on the phone with fire rescue and emts they're getting ambulance services but you have to understand those guys aren't coming in until we've made a safe path for them they're just not um so so yeah the the response and and you and i understand this there's so many people that that think they do until you're in that position um we are by nature we are emotional creatures and like you were talking about the 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 guy that that has to go by the guy, you know, with his hand extended. Um, it, it's not my mission right now. Yep. My mission there's, is, is to there's stop. a whole battalion size element of people right behind you that yes. can do that. Yes. But if you're, if you're in the lead, if you're the tip of the spear and he has not been found yet, and you're one of the ones hunting him, then your job a hundred percent, 
is hunting because the best trauma care you can give to everybody there is to stop the, the person that's causing the trauma. Yes. Um, and everything gets a thousand percent easier after you stop the active shooter, finding casualties, evaluating them, treating them, evacuating them, crime scene, clearing the building. Everything gets so much easier after we stop the active shooter. Yes. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's just things that, that I think all our members are, I, I think it's incumbent on us to educate them and teach them these things. But like you're, you and I are talking about, it, it's so easy to sit here and, and think mentally that well, I can do that. Now, you can do that until you have to do that. And, and then we see which, which way you go. Um, and I, I've seen it with, with cops. I've seen it with good cops that just, and it, and it could be nothing more than that day. You know, every other day they are, you know, scale of one to 10, they're a 10. But on this day, I don't know what happened. He's a six. You know, I give me somebody else. I want Ed. Yeah. Uh, but you have you to had, go with what you have. You had Parkland where eight out of eight deputies didn't go. You had Uvalde where the lead cops rushed in there like aggression exactly. But as soon as they took fire, they backed off. Yes. Uh, but then you have uh, the Covenant School, which again, I don't know why they got in the building so late but once they got in the building uh took care of business didn't give a verbal command just went in there and took care of, but then you also have the 22 year old young man in the mall in indiana who stood up and aggressed on and also shot down the active shooter so the badge is irrelevant how much training you have is not the factor uh the the, the sro at parkland had over 30 years of law enforcement experience and didn't go inside the building a 22 year old in Greenwood Mall had no military or police experience and no professional gun training, but he got the job done. Are you present? Are you willing? And are you armed? Are the three most important factors? I'm going to steal that just to let you know right now. Yeah. And present means you're close enough to hear it or see it, not you're somewhere on the property, but 90% uh, success rate. If someone is close enough to hear or see the first shot, they have a gun and they're willing to act aggressively. That That's the best possible plan we can have. So instead of hoping for an Eli Dickin, we should plan to have an Eli Dickin. Yeah, you should. Um, you know, we had one, the first one I ever responded to was a, uh, a mistaken thing. They, they misread people driving by a private school and they see something and they're like, oh, my God, that guy just walked into that campus with a, with a long gun. And fortunately, we had a watch commander that night that was not afraid to, to pull every resource he could. And as soon as that call came out, I called him direct because I knew he was the watch commander that night. And I said, listen, gang unit is 10-8. We're not on anything right now. Do you need us? And he said, absolutely. Get here right now. Um, but it's a 60 acre campus with multiple buildings, some as tall as five stories. And the entire time that we're working that scene, we're, we're having to get additional resources because every time we, we clear a floor, we have to drop somebody. We, and we're dropping a patrol guy. We're not dropping the assault team. Um, but it's, it's one of those that every single time you go through a doorway, you have to go through that doorway with, the intent and expectation that that's where my threat is. And it took us three hours to clear that campus in, and that was fast. And how mentally burnt were you at the we end were, of that time? This is the worst, worst shift I ever worked in my life. Yeah. I was so fatigued. Um, I've yeah. never, I was never that fatigued actually facing a shooter. Yep. So, um, what are what are some other things that you got for us that that uh, doesn't necessarily have to be a school thing? But you know, you talked about uh, pulse and and other things. You know, that's kind of kind of rule of law around most states that you know you're not carrying a firearm in a in a place where alcoholic beverages are consumed and things like that, where that's their primary function. Yeah, and that's one of the things with Arkansas uh, back in eighteen passed the enhanced level license. So you go take a little more training, they mark your license enhanced, and you can carry in about 10 or 11 additional places. And one of those additional places 
is any place that serves alcohol by the drink. And of course, people scream buddy murder. We should not mix guns and alcohol. It's like we're not mixing them. We're co-locating them. If I put some dynamite in a file cabinet on this side of the room and a Bic lighter in a drawer on this side of the room, we have not mixed those two, which is dangerous. We have co-located. For decades, we've been saying, if you're going to go drink to, to the point that you're in any way to impair, take a designated driver, take somebody sober along with you that can get you home safe. Well, there's no reason that designated driver cannot also be the sober security. Yeah. And the reason we had borderline bar and grill and pulse in other places is because no one in there is carrying and it is shooting fish in a barrel. So we have to start thinking through that now. Um, now, you know, the Pulse nightclub, he Googled nightclubs in Orlando. I don't know if, why he chose nightclubs, if that's one of maybe one of the reasons he didn't think anybody would fight back. Uh, but we have to, it's, it's not a big change in words, but it's a 180 degree difference. We have to get all organizational leaders, church, schools, businesses to go from turn out the lights, lock the door, hunker down, wait for somebody to stop it to we are going to stop it. A lot of those words are the same, but that's 180 degrees. And what I think of after coming out of the military, 24 years, all we do is train, plan for, maintain equipment, all to do ruthless, vicious, deadly violence against other people. And we fully expect while we're doing that to have vicious, ruthless, deadly violence done against us. The thought of that and the planning for that is, it's what we do. It's not out of the ordinary at all. But then you get within people with no military experience or law enforcement experience. I mean, cops know they're going to get called to go someplace where eventually they're going to have to do some kind of violence against yes. people because some people don't want to behave and some people don't want to go to jail, believe it or not. But when you, it took me too long to realize when I'm talking to these schools, uh, thinking about doing and I'm not talking about just violence, like giving them a bloody lip or a bloody nose. We're talking about vicious, incapacitating, deadly violence. School leaders don't want to think about it, much less talk about it, much less actually plan for that. That goes against every fiber of their being. So what is their plan? It's to do what is natural. How many times a day do you turn a light switch on and off? Been doing that our whole life. It's very easy. So we just tell the people, just turn the light switch off. We know how to do that. Lock the door. We lock doors multiple times a day. That's very easy. And we just wait. And that's very easy to do. And it doesn't upset us. Like you're going to have to get ready to do vicious violence against somebody upsets us. Uh, we just have to, and that's just the way the world ought to be. And we, we have to teach people that don't already know uh, what reloads and malfunctions of guns look like. We don't even have to bring the guns in. We can make one, two minute videos. Very simple. If you see this kind of movement, then what, what you're experiencing, what you are witnessing is a malfunction or a reload. And what, what I tell teachers that, that have no experience, like just think you're stapler, that thing runs out of staples. What do you have to do? You have to open it up and reload it. And that takes them out of time. If your stapler gets jammed up, what do you have to do? Pry it open empty it out, put a new roll in and that they understand it. And so that's a, that's a window of time that that stapler doesn't work, which means that's a window of time that that gun doesn't work. And if you're going to run away from him or fight him, what a better time to do it than those few seconds where his gun doesn't work. So that is just unbelievably valuable information yeah. that we need to show people because I can show them examples, multiple examples where potential victims either chose to fight during the reload or malfunction or choose to run and, and but both are good choices but if i have no idea what that reload or malfunction looks like i cannot take advantage of that and so what we teach them is there are three options there are actually two choices but there's three options and it's fight flee and barricade fight and flee are only two choices so this is this is a very simple thing to decide while you're under stress either fight evil and stop it or run away from it that's very simple. Either go towards it and fight it or run away from it. Barricade's not a choice. It's it's what you do when you don't have a choice. If you yeah, cannot no fight choice. or cannot flee, then barricade. Yeah. The problem is most schools, for because it's easy to type and easy to drill, they go to barricade first. Turn out the lights, lock the door, get in the corner. You don't want to do that unless you can't do the other two. And then even if you do barricade, you still don't hide in the corner. You get ready to fight him should he try to force his way in. 
because that is a great place to fight him. He gives up a lot of the advantages of having a gun uh, if you do that. So uh, one of the things we do with schools after we teach them about that, and we can talk to them about changes in physical structure. And there's a bunch of companies out there making a bunch of money selling stuff to schools that really won't help, but they're promising, hey, buy our product, buy our system, install our system, and your kids will be safe. And that's yeah. really not true. There's just a few things I think can really help. One thing is, well, we have to, we, we need to be able to turn off the audible part of the fire alarm once the leaders of the school determine that it's not a fire. We got to be able to do that quickly. We need to find in a cost effective way to bulletproof the tables in the, in the cafeteria. Cause in high schools, cafeteria is one of the most likely places he's going to attack. And I mean, lock down, you don't, you can't lock down a cafeteria full of 600 kids. Yeah. But if the tables are bulletproof and we can flip them up on their sides, then you're going to slow down his rate of getting hits on people a lot until whoever's going to fight this guy fights and stops him. On elementary schools, playgrounds is one of the places they attack. And they're literally fishing a barrel out there. So two things there. One is we have to tell the schools to leave the door open between the playground and the building when there are kids on the playground. But they get this bumper sticker, lock all doors, lock all doors. Well, not all doors, not that door. Because if the door to, to, that lets kids from the playground into the building stays locked during recess, they got nowhere to go. They are fish in a barrel. We need to start building uh, ballistic walls on the playground. Easiest and cheapest I can think of is just hayite brick, four feet high, fill the holes with mortar, and paint them bright colors so they don't look like that. They don't look like something tactical. They look like something fun. And the kids just know if the shooting starts, they go to the opposite side of that wall and hunker down until whoever we have there that's going to stop the active shooter stops the active shooter. We need to color code hallways. So responding cops and EMTs, when they go into that school that they're not familiar with, they know purple hallway, the yellow hallway, the red hallway, and then convex uh, mirrors in the intersections of the hallways. Because I want people doing one or two things, going towards evil to kill it or running away from evil. And that those concave mirrors will help both of the... Or, uh, convex mirrors will help uh, both people do that. And we, and I got to get you out here. <laughs> I got to get you out here. Um, we'll discuss later. Yeah, and I would I would like to there, do a deal for some some uh, SROs in Oklahoma, and I'd also like to get something for some administrators. I've I've got some friends of mine that are administrators and superintendents that that actually have a say um every bit of this stuff is so so incredibly valuable and it's not that difficult no it's not i'm uh, i'm a i was a tanker in the army and we're not known to be the bright guys so if i can figure it out this is not <laughs> this is simple math this is jethro bodine math i'm not doing calculus here but Kind of what we've learned is if we do these series of presentations, you know, we need to do the school one both during the day and at night during the day. The, the administrators can break away to come, but the, they are not going to let their teachers go during the day unless it's a day that the kids don't come to school. And then the parents. So the presentation during the day is for the school administrators. That same presentation at night, the parents and the teachers can come to. And then the cops, usually, they get that needs to be during the day because most of them won't come during their free time. But and I think it'd be a good idea for the cops to come not only to the cop, uh, what I call that one is critical lessons learned for law enforcement, but uh, especially the SROs, but other cops as well to come to the school one. Yeah, I, I appreciate that, brother. We're going to be in communication about that. I know you've been out to to uh, Mead Hall, but yeah, we're a little bit further west and a little further south. But we've we've got our own private range as well. That uh, actually Tom's done a couple of classes, and I was going to be in his revolver class and missed that because I was responding to a, a member involved incident. But uh, I, I'm still very actively seeking instruction from Mr. Given. So uh, I got him in the fall, actually at at Mead Hall for his shotgun course. So. Um, I'd like to come out and see your place too, brother. I really would. Sure. Anytime. Uh, have, we just did our May, we did 
two in April. We just this past week ended our a uh, May uh, active shooter instructor. The next one's in October. It's filled. Uh, and then we have one in April 13th, 14th, and 24 that still has open seats. But yeah, come anytime. Well, we're hosting Tom's reunion, Range Master reunion in August. We're hosting here, and he's doing his five day protective pistol craft uh, here in October. So. Very cool. Well, buddy, I appreciate you so much for taking the time to to come in and and share a little bit of knowledge with us. And uh, if there's anything that we can do for for you and your brother, man, don't don't hesitate, reach out and let us know. And we'd be happy to do a little collaboration with you if we, in so, whatever regard. Same here. Uh, Oklahoma is a pretty decent, easy drive from here. Yeah. Well, I want to thank everybody for tuning in today. Um, if you have any questions, comments, concerns, you can reach me directly. It's Rob, R-O-B, at ccwsafe.com. Um, Ed, how do, how do folks reach out and, and see what, kind of things you have and and how to get a hold of uh you and your training company and and that kind of thing yeah we're pretty low-key we don't even have a face we only have a website we have a facebook page last last resort farms training you can find on facebook or my personal page uh ed monk on facebook or my email is my name ed monk e-d-m-o-n-k at aol.com yeah i still use aol <laughs> and then my cell is 870-273-1113 and then uh, just to add, Mark Twain said there's nothing to be learned from the second kick of the mule. We need to get uh, all the schools that are still sitting right behind the mule and get them out from behind there before the next kick happens. Yeah, you're absolutely correct, brother. And thank you so much again. Thank you. You bet. Bye, guys. We'll see you next time. <clears throat>